All right, we've talked about ionic compounds and nomenclature. We talked about covalent compounds. Now we have to look at covalent nomenclature. Remember, nomenclature is just a fancy word to how do we name stuff. So we want to look at it for covalent compounds. Remember, covalent compounds are between two or more nonmetals. And when we look at these compounds, it can be somewhat easier than with ionic compounds because there's no figuring out charges. A covalent compound is what it is. So why do we need a system of nomenclature that distinguishes different covalent compounds from one another? Why can't we just do the same thing that we did for ionic compounds? Well, we don't have charges, so it doesn't allow us to predict the formulas. And when we look at covalent compounds, what we see is that there are so many different ways to combine two elements. When I looked at an ionic compound, say sodium chloride, there was only one way I can make that, one Na ion and one Cl minus. That's it. There's nothing else. However, just looking at nitrogen and oxygen, I've got listed at least six ways here, and there's probably a few more, that these molecules actually can come together and form a compound from the exact same elements. And so there's really no way for us to predict these ratios between the nitrogen and oxygen. And so what we have to do is figure out a way to name them that tells us exactly what compound we're talking about. If I say sodium chloride, you know that that means NaCl. I can figure that out from knowing something about the metal and the nonmetal and the number of electrons. Not quite as easy with covalent compounds. However, it does make naming a lot easier and getting from a name to a formula super easy. So here we're looking at our covalent compounds and we see we have a metal or a nonmetal, excuse me, and another nonmetal. So what we do is we take the first nonmetal, and the first nonmetal is just the one that's written first in the formula, and then we take that name and we put a prefix before it that tells us how many we have, and then we do the exact same thing with the second nonmetal, only we also change the ending to IDE, just like we did with the ionic compounds. And so these prefixes are going to be the key that tell us how much we have, how many we have of each type of atom. So I want to name the first element in the formula first, and the second element gets the IDE ending. So for example, we can say CO is carbon monoxide. Now we'll talk about that prefix in just a minute, how we get there. But what we see is that we have the IDE ending, carbon doesn't change. These prefixes help us indicate the number of each element. Here we have dinitrogen tetroxide. So the di is the prefix here. The tetra is the prefix in the second one. And we'll go through a list of those prefixes and talk about some of the rules. You might be saying, well, why don't we have a prefix here in front of carbon? And that's one of our exceptions of when we don't use a prefix. Because we've already heard so many times where this is the exception. Well, there are going to be exceptions to the naming as well. So the prefixes that tell us what we're looking at are mono, means one, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, octanana, and deca. So anytime I see the prefix deca, that means I have 10 of that atom. Remember, deca sounds like decade. Well, they come from the same root word. Nana looks a little like nine. Remember, when we look at octa, what we can think of is our stop sign. And so octa, when we look at our stop sign, actually has eight sides to it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is why I'm not an art student. So we have our stop sign has eight sides. That's a sad looking octagon, but it's a stop sign with eight sign, eight sides to it. And then we get hepta, seven, tri, we can think about a tricycle, which has three wheels, die is two. Um, and so just some ways to remember what those are. So now these are prefixes. You just need to memorize these, and we're going to use these when we look at naming valent compounds. So what are some of the rules that we use? Well, one thing we do is that we say, well, mono can be omitted for the first element. So if we have carbon and oxygen, we name it carbon monoxide, not monocarbon monoxide. For oxides, if we have prefixes ending in an A, we drop it. We tend to avoid OA combinations, okay? or we end in the o or a -O combinations. So we avoid those. So for monoxide, we don't have monoxide, we have monoxide. Tetra, we have tetroxide. Whoops, we got a little overlap here. So we have N2O4 is dinitrogen.
tetroxide. So we've dropped that A from the tetra and just kind of run it together. Now on the exam, I'm not going to give you questions that test you between tetraoxide and tetroxide. I wouldn't do that. However, on the homework, you do need to be careful about that. It will be checking that in the nomenclature in the spelling. But you get multiple attempts, so that's one thing to always check if you get a covalent compound name incorrect. Notice that the prefix comes in there. There's no space between the prefix and the names, and there is one space between the different elements. So these are just some of the kind of guidelines. Again, the best way to learn how to do this is just to practice, and these are really the only kind of exceptions we have to worry about. So let's look at some examples here. We have SO3. So what I look at is I have sulfur and oxygen. And I see I have one sulfur, so the prefix for that is mono, but it's the first element. So I'm going to omit that, and I'm just going to say sulfur. And then I look at my oxygen. I have three oxygens, so I'm going to use the prefix tri to represent three. And I'm going to change the ending on the oxygen to IDE, so I get sulfur trioxide. I only omit the, uh, the mono if it's in front of the first element. I always put a prefix by this by the second element regardless of what the number is. So we have sulfur trioxide and if I had the name I could easily get back to the formula and we'll see that in the next example. So we have carbon tetrachloride. So we have carbon, we know there's no prefix in front of the carbon so that tells us we only have one of them. I go to the end and I see chloride so I know that that's chlorine is the element and it has the prefix tetra so that means we have four of them. So CCL4 is carbon tetrachloride. Now H2O you probably recognize as water, but you may have seen the hoax email going around that talks about this evil substance called dihydrogen. Okay, Because I have two hydrogen atoms, so dihydrogen monoxide. Okay. And notice I used my prefix here, even though there was only one of them, because it's not the first element. So I have dihydrogen monoxide, because I have one oxygen there. So we can call this water, that's the common name, the official IUPAC name of following our nomenclature rules is dihydrogen monoxide. So the person, that is the group that decides all these rules is called IUPAC, which is the International Union on Pure and Applied Chemistry. And so when you look at all the rules for nomenclature, they're the ones, they're a committee of people that decide the rules. So if we have new classes of compounds, uh, when we have new elements, when they're looking at data in the, in the periodic table to decide if numbers need to be updated for, because there's new data, new results, then that is the group that does that. So they're the ones that have established these rules. And the reason we have all these rules with nomenclature is because we want to make sure that we're all talking about the same substance. If I say sulfur trioxide, you need to know exactly what I'm talking about. And, SO3, and we also know that that also always means SO3. So using this to be able to compare, um, to look at values or at names across um, different parts of the world and know that we're all talking about the same thing. So the last example we're going to look at here is got P4S10. So again, I'm going to write down my elements. I have phosphorus and I have sulfur. And then I see I've got a 4 there, so that means I need the prefix tetra. I'm going to put that with the phosphorus, tetraphosphorus, all one word. And then I see 10, and the prefix for 10 is deca. And I change the ending on sulfur to IDE, so I have phosphorus deca sulfide, and that tetraphosphorus deca sulfide, and that's actually the name of my compound. Now, if I'm given the name, it's very easy to get back to the formula because all I have to do is go through and look at what prefixes I'm using in my formula. So, for example, let's say we started with this tetraphosphorus deca sulfide and we're trying to get back to the formula. I see I have phosphorus and sulfide, so I know I'm going to have P and S. I see tetra, which tells me I have four of those, and I see deca, which tells me I have ten of those. So, covalent nomenclature is a little bit easier because of the prefixes and what information it tells us. And we don't have to predict the formula like we do with ionic compounds. We can just be given the formula. But we do have to decide, are we going to use ionic nomenclature or covalent nomenclature? Remember, ionic, metal and nonmetal, covalent, two nonmetals. Two different types of compounds, two different sets of rules.